If you open a Protestant Christian Bible and look at the table of contents, you'll notice the first three quarters is a collection called the Old Testament. If you look at the list of books, you'll see it's made up of 39 smaller works that are grouped into four main sections. The first five are called the Pentateuch, followed by the historical books, then the poetic books, and finally the books of the prophets. Now that seems simple enough, but actually it's more complicated and way more interesting. This arrangement of the books in a single volume called the Old Testament is a later Christian tradition that developed after Jesus and the apostles. In ancient Jewish tradition, these works were all on separate scrolls and were conceived of as a unified three-part collection called Tanakh. It's a Hebrew acronym for Torah, which means instruction, Nevi'im, which means prophets, and Ketuvim, which means writings. The Tanakh has the same books as the Protestant Old Testament, but they're arranged differently. The Torah corresponds to the Pentateuch, but the prophets consist of four historical narrative books and then the 15 works named after specific prophets. After this comes the writings, a diverse collection of poetic and narrative texts. Now this three-part design is really, really old. It's referred to in ancient Jewish texts like the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Wisdom of Ben Sirah, even Jesus of Nazareth mentioned it. And that's because this three-part shape is woven into the compositional design of the scrolls themselves. If you pay attention, you'll discover that every scroll has been coordinated by means of cross-references that link each work into the larger three-part collection. So who put all these scrolls together? It was a long process. Some of the famous contributors are named, like Moses or David, but most of the authors remain anonymous. In the Bible, they're simply called scribes or the prophets. These scrolls took shape throughout Israel's history as generations of prophetic scribes collected earlier stories and poems, integrated them into larger compositions, and then eventually shaped all this material into the unified library of scrolls, the Tanakh. It's clear from texts in the Psalms and Prophets that these prophetic scribes believed that God's Spirit was guiding this whole process so that through these human words, God speaks to his people. That's why they treasured these texts, studying and composing them into a unified collection. We don't know when precisely this process was finished, but it was somewhere in the last centuries before the time of Jesus. In its final shape, the Tanakh offers a prophetic interpretation of Israel's history that claims to reveal God's purposes to rescue the whole world. And while we can't do justice to the whole collection in one video, it's helpful to get an overview of what these scrolls are all about. The Torah begins with God creating and blessing a great piece of real estate, our very good world. And God entrusts it to a creature that reflects the divine image. Human, or in Hebrew, Adam. God appoints humanity to rule the world as kings and queens of creation. And the question is whether they will trust God's wisdom to discern good and evil, or seize autonomy and define good and evil for themselves. But there's another creature with the humans, a mysterious snake. It's in rebellion against the Creator, and it dupes the humans to foolishly rebel against God's generosity. As a result, humanity is separated from its divine source of life and exiled from a garden of blessing to die in a dangerous wilderness. From there, humanity keeps spreading and redefining good and evil, and things go downhill fast. They build cities plagued by violence and oppression, all leading to the foundation of a city called Babylon where people exalt themselves to the place of God. And now the basic plot conflict of the whole Bible is set. God wants to bless his world and rule it through humans. But now humans are the problem. They're under the influence of evil. They're stupid and short-sighted and headed for self-destruction. And this is all a setup for God's solution. We need a new kind of human. And so God promises that a new human will come who won't give in to the snake. In fact, he'll crush it and be crushed by it. From here, the story traces the promised lineage to a man and a woman, Abraham and Sarah. God entrusts them with the same divine blessing given to humanity on page one. And so they leave Babylon to a new garden-like land that God promises to give his family. What follows is the story of Abraham's family. Three generations, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, followed by 12 sons. And our hopes are high, until we read their very dysfunctional and destructive family story. They lie, cheat, nearly kill each other, not to mention the sex scandals. But what did you expect after the garden story? They're humans. Eventually, Abraham's family ends up exiled down in Egypt. 
All these failures of Abraham's family form a dark background for the handful of bright moments in the story. God stays committed to these people. He even makes them an eternal promise called a covenant that he will rescue and bless all humanity through them. How exactly? Isn't clear. But Abraham's family is at its best when they stop their selfish scheming and trust God's promise with radical faith. From here, the family grows. They end up enslaved in Egypt and were introduced to the Torah's other main character, Moses. God raises him up to rescue the Israelites and bring them to a mountain where they're all invited into a covenant relationship with God. They're given 613 terms of the relationship, guidelines for becoming new kinds of humans who will faithfully represent God to the world. And Moses brokers this whole deal because he's awesome. He's the ultimate prophet who speaks God's word to Israel. He's a priest who represents them before God. And he's even called a king, Israel's leader and deliverer in time of need. But as the Torah progresses, the Israelites fail big time. They violate the covenant and even Moses rebels against God. In fact, the Torah ends with Moses predicting that Israel's failure will continue as they go back into the promised land and they're going to end up in exile once again. But he has hope that God will fulfill his promise to rescue Israel. One day he will cover for their failures. He'll heal their selfish hearts so they can truly love God and live. And then Moses dies. Now, the final sentences of the Torah scroll are surprising. They zoom forward in time. And we hear from the prophetic scribes who shaped the Tanakh. They reflect back on the story of Moses from their vantage point, And they tell us that never again in Israel's history did a prophet like Moses arise. Man, I wish another prophet, priest, king like him would come along. And with that, we move into the Nevi'im. It has two sub-collections. First, the former prophets, four narrative works about Israel's story in the Promised Land, told from the later perspective of the prophets. Things start great with Joshua's leadership. We're told he's successful because he's just like Moses, and he meditates on Scripture day and night. But eventually, even Joshua fails, beginning Israel's long and violent descent into self-destruction, just like Moses and the Garden story anticipated. These stories mostly focus on the failure of Israel's kings, prophets, and priests, how they lie, cheat, and kill each other, and worship idols. It's basically a longer, bloodier replay of the ancestors' failures. But there are some bright spots. God reaffirms his covenant promise to bless humanity through a new human. It will be a king from the line of David. And you get some stories about people like David or Solomon who have moments like Abraham when they trust God, but it never lasts. And wouldn't you know it, the family of Abraham ends up right where they began, conquered and exiled in Babylon. But remember, this whole story is being told from the later perspective of the prophets, and they know exile isn't the end. So they design these stories of Israel's past as pointers to their future hope. When God does rescue his people out of Babylon, he'll send that new king who will be like Moses and David and Solomon were on their good days. In fact, this is what the second part of the Nevi'im, the latter prophets, is all about. There are three large and 12 short works connected to specific prophets. And this design intentionally recalls the three plus 12 ancestors from Genesis whose stories of failure contained the seeds of future hope. These prophetic scrolls are loaded with cross-references that link back into the narrative of the Torah and the prophets, and they carry the story further. The job of Israel's prophets was to be like Moses, to accuse the old Israel of failure and corruption, and to warn them about the looming result, the great day of the Lord, which ended with defeat and exile in Babylon. But the prophets also promised that God had a purpose, to purify his people and recreate a new Israel who would be faithful like Abraham was. They'll live in a new covenant relationship with God under the reign of that promised ruler, who's described as a new Moses, but called by the name David. He will be the one to restore God's blessing to the entire world. The conclusion of the Nevi'im is just like the Torah. There's a note from the Tanakh's prophetic scribes. They reflect back over the whole story so far, and they urge readers to anticipate the arrival of a new Moses-like prophet, who they call Elijah. He will announce the arrival of Israel's God to purify and save his people. From here, we move into the Tanakh's third and final sub-collection, the Ketuvim, a diverse collection of scrolls. 
Each one has been designed to link back into the key themes from the Torah and the prophets and develop them further through an elaborate tapestry of cross-references. For example, the Psalms scroll is introduced by two poems that are coordinated to the beginning of the Torah and the prophets. In the first psalm, we meet the righteous one, who's described as a new Joshua, a successful leader who meditates on the scriptures. He's like the king promised by Moses, and he's like the eternal tree of life in the Garden of Eden. Psalm 2 then identifies this figure. It's the promised king, the son of God from the line of David, who's going to defeat evil among the nations and restore God's blessing to the world. And the rest of the psalm scroll teaches God's people how to pray as they wait for this future hope. Then there are the wisdom scrolls that address some of the most difficult questions raised by the story of the Torah and the prophets. So Proverbs sounds like Moses in the Torah. Trust in God, be faithful and obedient, and you'll have peace and success. But then Ecclesiastes and Job reflect back on Israel's complicated history and say, yeah, we tried that, and it's not that simple. These three books carry on a profound conversation about what it means to live wisely in God's good and often confusing world. Two of the last books of the Tanakh to be written make a crucial contribution. The Daniel scroll looks back over the long history of Israel's failure and suffering as a strange door of hope into a new future for the world. One day, that new human promised in the Torah and prophets will arrive. He's going to be trampled by humanity's animal-like inclinations towards evil, but then God will vindicate him and raise him up to rule the world in divine power. And finally, the Scroll of Chronicles retells the entire story of the Tanakh from the beginning up to Israel's return from exile. The author focuses on God's promise to David of a future king who will reunite God's people in a new Jerusalem and bring divine blessing to the nations. The final lines of the Chronicles scroll have been coordinated with key texts from all over the Tanakh. They keep alive the hope of an ultimate return from exile, pointing to the arrival of an Israelite whose God is with him, that he may go up and restore the new Jerusalem. And that's how the story ends. The Tanakh is a majestically and intentionally designed collection of ancient Hebrew scrolls. These diverse texts from all periods of Israel's history have been woven together as a unified story about God's covenant promise to Israel and to all humanity. They were made for a lifetime's worth of reading and reflection, as these remarkable human words offer a divine word of wisdom and future hope that still speaks today. The book of Genesis. It's the first book of the Bible, and its storyline divides into two main parts. There's chapters 1 through 11, which tell the story of God and the whole world. And then there's chapters 12 through 50, which zoom in and tell the story of God and just one man, Abraham, and then his family. And these two parts are connected by a hinge story at the beginning of chapter 12. And this design, it gives us a clue to how to understand the message of the book as a whole and how it introduces the story of the whole Bible. So the book begins with God taking the disorder and the darkness described in the second sentence of the Bible, and God brings out of it order and beauty and goodness. He makes a world where life can flourish. And God makes these creatures called humans, or Adam in Hebrew. He makes them in his image, which has to do with their role and purpose in God's world. So the humans are made to be reflections of God's character out into the world. And they're appointed as God's representatives to rule his world on his behalf, which in context means to harness all of its potential to care for it and make it a place where even more life can flourish. God blesses the humans. It's a key word in this book. And he gives them a garden. It's like a place from which they begin starting to build this new world. Now, the key is that the humans have a choice about how they're going to go about building this world. And that's represented by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Up till now, God has provided and defined what is good and what is not. Good. But now God is giving the humans the dignity and the freedom of a choice. Are they going to trust God's definition of good and evil, or are they going to seize autonomy and define good and evil for themselves? And the stakes are really high. To rebel against God is to embrace death because you're turning away from the giver of life himself. This is represented by the tree of life. 
And so in chapter 3, a mysterious figure, a snake, enters into the story. The snake's given no introduction other than it's a creature that God made. And it becomes clear that it's a creature in rebellion against God, and it wants to lead the humans into rebellion and their death. The snake tells a different story about the tree and the choice. It says that seizing the knowledge of good and evil are not going to bring death, that it's actually the way to life and becoming like God themselves. Now, the irony of this is tragic because we know the humans, they're already like God. They were made to reflect God's image. But instead of trusting God, the humans seize autonomy. They take the knowledge of good and evil for themselves and in an instant, the whole story spirals out of control. The first casualty is human relationships. The man and the woman, they suddenly realize how vulnerable they are. Now, they can't even trust each other. And so they make clothes and they hide their bodies from one another. The second casualty is that intimacy between God and the humans is lost. So they go and run and hide from God. And then when God finds them, they start this game of blame shifting about who rebelled first. Now, right here, the story stops. And there's a series of short poems where God declares to the snake and then to the humans the tragic consequences of their actions. God first tells the snake that despite its apparent victory, it is destined for defeat to eat dust. God promises that one day a seed or a descendant will come from the woman who's going to deliver a lethal strike to the snake's head, which sounds like great news, but this victory is going to come with a cost because the snake too will deliver a lethal strike to the descendant's heel as it's being crushed. It's a very mysterious promise of this wounded victor. But in the flow of the story so far, you see this is an act of God's grace. The humans, they've just rebelled. And what does God do? He promises to rescue them. But this doesn't erase the consequences of the human's decision. So God informs them that now every aspect of their life together at home and out in the field, it's going to be fraught with grief and pain because of the rebellion, all leading to their death. From here, the story then spirals downward. Chapters 3 through 11, they trace the widening ripple effect of the rebellion and of human relationships fracturing at every level. So there's a story about two brothers, Cain and Abel. Cain's so jealous of his brother that he wants to murder him. And God warns him not to give in to the temptation, but he does anyway. He murders him in the field. So Cain then goes on to build a city where violence and oppression reign. And this is all epitomized in the story of Lamech. He's the first man in the Bible to have more than one wife. He's accumulating them like property. And then he goes on to sing a short song about how he's more violent and vengeful than Cain ever was. After this, we get an odd story about the sons of God, which could refer to evil angelic beings, or it could refer to ancient kings who claimed that they descended from the gods. And like Lamech, they acquire as many wives as they wanted, and they produce the Nephilim, these great warriors of old. Whichever view is right, the point is that humans are building kingdoms that fill God's world with violence and even more corruption. In response, we're told that God is broken with grief. Humanity is ruining his good world, and they're ruining each other. And so out of a passion to protect the goodness of his world, he washes it clean of humanity's evil with a great flood. But he protects one blameless human, Noah, and his family, and he commissions him as a new Adam. He repeats the divine blessing and commissions him to go out into the world. And so our hopes are really high, but then Noah fails too, and also in a garden. He goes and he plants a vineyard, and he gets drunk out of his mind. And then one of his sons, Ham, does something shameful to his father in the tent. And so here we have our new Adam, naked and ashamed just like the first, and the downward spiral begins again. It all leads to the foundation of the city of Babylon. The people of ancient Mesopotamia, they come together around this new technology they have, the brick. And they can make cities and towers bigger and faster than anybody's ever done before. And they want to build a new kind of tower that will reach up to the gods, and they will make a great name for themselves. It's an image of human rebellion and arrogance. It's the garden rebellion now writ large. And so God humbles their pride and scatters them. Now, this is a diverse group of stories, but you can see they're all exploring the same basic point. God keeps giving humans the chance to do the right thing with his world, and humans keep ruining it. 
these stories are making a claim that we live in a good world that we have turned bad, that we've all chosen to define good and evil for ourselves, and so we all contribute to this world of broken relationships leading to conflict and violence and ultimately death. But there's hope. God promised that one day a descendant would come, the wounded victor who will defeat evil at its source. And so despite humanity's evil, God is determined to bless and rescue his world. And so the big question, of course, is what is God going to do? And the next story, The Hinge, offers the answer. But for now, that's what Genesis 1-11 through is all about. Genesis, Genesis 1 In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse, and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground 
according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Genesis 2 Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Delium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria and the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock, and to the birds of the heavens, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam 
there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Genesis 3 Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife 
garments of skins, and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life.